Hello. Thank you for taking the time to listen and watch this short video on the rules of thumb guidance. My name is Susie. And I'm Siobhan. And we're both registered nurses and clinical educators at St Anne's Hospice. And we're going to talk about and explain each rule of thumb in the guidance. This video was created in St Anne's Hospice 50th birthday year and can be found on our website at www.sah.org.uk and on our YouTube channel. So the Rules of Thumb guidance wasn't created by us at St Anne's Hospice, but was created as part of a research project funded by Marie Curie and the Alzheimer's Society, led by Dr Nathan Davis and Professor Steve Liff. It was developed by an experienced team of researchers and health and social care professionals, including GPs and psychiatrists from the University College London and King's College London, and also a group of family carers. We want to acknowledge and thank everyone involved in creating this national piece of guidance. Plus, in the northwest of England, we want to thank Dementia United, Dr Helen Martin, who is a Manchester GP, and Jane Ashworth, who is an educator at Spring Hill Hospice, and the End of Life Partnership for collaborating to develop a training package around the rules of thumb guidance, which will be available from the July 2021 on the End of Life Partnership website. So, Siobhan, why do we need to discuss end of life care for individuals with dementia? So Susie, as you know, dementia and Alzheimer's is now the leading cause of death in the UK, as reported by Hospice UK Inequalities Document 2018. However, there are still inequalities in end of life care. Compared to those without dementia, they are less likely to be referred to specialist end of life care and prescribed less palliative care medications. Having said this, recognising the end of life phase with those with dementia can be difficult due to issues with communication and how challenging it could be to predict deterioration of health. The rule of thumb end of life care for people with dementia 2020 discusses challenges associated with individuals with dementia at end of life and how these can be addressed. Each person with dementia is unique and will experience the condition in their own way. So what challenges do we need to be aware of when caring for individuals approaching the end of their life with dementia? When providing care and support for individuals approaching end of life with dementia, there are many things to consider. The rule of thumb guidance covers eating and swallowing difficulties, agitation and restlessness, reviewing of medication, sorry, treatments and interventions, and providing routine care at end of life. Caring for someone with dementia at the end of life means thinking about things in a slightly different way. And that's what the rule of thumb guidance will help with. The guidance is designed to help any healthcare professional make, make decisions, provide support and care when caring for or people with dementia at end of their life. It's easy to use and practical. So how could these challenges be reduced? Knowing the individual's wishes could aid with supporting and caring for the people with dementia at end of life. Having an advanced care plan discussion discussions while still able to make these decisions regarding their care would ensure that they receive the care they wish when unable to make these decisions. So does dementia cause eating and swallowing difficulties? As, as the individual's demand, dementia advances, swallowing can become a problem. Please look at the slide on the screen for the rule and form guidance on eating and swallowing difficulties. It is important to remember swallowing, swallowing difficulties can also be a sign that the individual is entered in the last phase of their life when we need to bear in mind that swallowing difficulties are particularly common if 
an individual becomes unwell or a weaker, for example, if they have an infection. Once the cause has been treated, their ability to swallow may improve. So what can we do if an individual swallow has deteriorated and they're receiving treatment for an infection? So the rule of thumb guidance suggests you can discuss the individual's hydration and nutritional needs with the with the GP regarding potential use of a nasogastric tube for a limited time, after which the swallowing should be reassessed by the speech and language therapists. Right, OK, but what if we do if an individual swallow remains poor or they begin to choke? You need to establish whether it's an emergency or not. If it's an emergency, shout for help, commence first aid and call for an ambulance. If it's not an emergency, refer to speech and language therapists to assess their swallow. The individual may struggle with tablets and therefore may be appropriate to liaise with the GP regarding changing the individual's medications to liquids and using other routes. OK, thanks for that. So what do we do if the individual is approaching end of their life and asks for food and drink when they swallow is poor? Where possible, adapt diet and fluid as per speech and language therapy recommendations. When an individual's approaching the last days of life, we need to weigh up the risks of aspiration with the pleasure and comfort the individual gets from enjoying their favourite meals and drinks. This is referred to as risk feeding or comfort feeding. There are measures we can take to minimise the risk of aspiration, such as ensuring the individual is sat in an upright position and ensuring that they're fully aware when awake, alert when providing them with food and drink. So you mentioned agitation and restlessness as one of the challenges as well. So, but doesn't dementia cause this anyway? Not necessarily. If you have a look at the slide on your screen now uh, for the rule of thumb guidance on agitation and restlessness, there are many factors that need to be considered when, when an individual becomes agitated. There could be environmental or physical factors at play. For example, some environmental factors could include that the individual is cold, bored, in an area that's too noisy for them or in an unfamiliar environment. Physical factors may include infection, urinary in retention, they're hungry, uh, they're uncomfortable or they're in pain. Um, people with dementia in pain may have difficulty expressing their needs. Um, we now have a three and a half minute video uh, titled The Change and Think Pain. This was developed by NAP Pharmaceuticals, um, which will help us to understand how a person with dementia may express they have pain and what we need to look for. Unfortunately, we are unable to play the video. Um, so if you copy the link on the PowerPoint presentation and pop that into search bar, and have a little watch, uh, that would be great. Um, having Moving on from this, uh, it is OK if you can't identify a cause for agitation and restlessness. In this case, you should consider non-drug therapies and then trial pain relief. If a person with dementia remains agitated despite making these changes, then it may be part of the dying process and their care and treatment needs to be regularly reviewed. So if it is believed that the person is dying um, and it is important to have a review of the condition, treatment event and interventions, please look at the slide on your screen showing the rule of thumb guidance on, on this. So Siobhan, who should be involved in these decisions? Decisions to continue or stop treatment or intervention should be discussed with discussed in the multidisciplinary team meetings. They need to adhere to any decisions made in the person's advanced care plan. 
if they have one and consult the person who holds a lasting power of attorney or their deputy. Any decisions to stop treatments and interventions should be should also involve frequent discussions with persons nominated family members and advocates. So is the current treatment or intervention contributing to their comfort or quality of life? Ensure that the family and the advocate is aware that stopping intrusive treatments is not indicative of giving up on the individual. We will just offer a different type of care that focuses on comfort and quality of life. If the treatment or intervention is still considered to be needed, then continue with the current care. Continue review, continually review comfort of the patient and their quality of life. There may be occasions when the treatment needs to be restarted as it may have a positive effect on their quality of life and comfort. Thanks for that, Siobhan. So if it is identified that the person is dying, um, there are uh, rules concerning routine care that are to be used in the final hours to days of, of their life. So if you um, please look at the screen, the slide on the screen, and that shows the rules of thumb guidance on routine care in the last days and hours. So Siobhan, can you just explain what routine care is? So, so routine care um, includes, but it's not exclusive, um, to mouth care, uh, washing and bathing, brushing the hair, changing person's bed sheets and clothing, uh, turning them to prevent pressure sores or skin irritation. Some types of uh, routine care are essential as they add to comfort of the person uh, and shouldn't be stopped, such as changing soiled or wet bed sheets or clothes and providing uh, mouth care. And who should decide the level of routine care that's provided for that person? Um, ultimately, uh, the individual, and hopefully this will be expressed in an advanced care plan, and that should be ex respected if the person has one. You should talk about routine care with the nominated family members or advocates in advance before issues arise. Make sure you understand what they believe to be an acceptable level of care and how it should be provided. If routine care does not cause distress, then continue to provide routine care to maintain comfort and dignity of the individual. But let colleagues know what you're doing and why, and care should always be documented. Right, well, lastly, really, what if routine care is causing distress for that person? Well, if routine care is causing distress for a person with dementia, See if there's different ways we can adapt the delivery of the care we provide. For example, changing the way we hold or touch a person to see if that helps. Consider giving anticipatory pain relief before providing essential care to see if that eases distress and discomfort. If the adaptions don't help, then try again later. Distress from routine care may be a reoccurring issue. If this is the case, discuss this with nominated family members or advocate and decide on an acceptable level of care. Some of the family members and advocates may not prioritise routine care at the end of life as it takes away from the valuable time they have with their relative. This needs to be discussed. Minimum care may be the kindest to the person with dementia at end of life and their dignity should be maintained. Well, thanks, Siobhan, for that um, and helping us to kind of understand um, the rule of thumb guidance. Um, it's a really important document, a really helpful document for all health and social care professionals who are looking after someone who is uh, who has got dementia, who's living with, with it and possibly potentially dying of it. So please um, find the guidance. Um, you can look for it on the search engine online and just look for uh, a search rule of thumb and dementia. You can also ask your GP, any Admiral nurses or any local palliative care uh, team for the document. And if you are struggling and need help and support, don't hesitate to contact any of those specialists. We hope 
listening to this walkthrough of the guidance has been helpful and informative for you. Uh, and again, we just want to uh, acknowledge all these people uh, on this slide on the screen for developing the national document in the first place, but also developing local training package. Uh, so thanks ever so much for listening and goodbye. Bye.